Hello, everybody. I'm Natasha Kassam, the director of the Lowy Institute's Public Opinion and Foreign Policy Program. Thank you so much for joining us here today. I would like to begin by acknowledging the Gadigal people of the Nora Nation and pay my respects to their elders past and present. So friends, colleagues, supporters, it is such a delight to welcome you today to the Lowy Institute to talk about this very important issue. It seems like it was only 18 months ago. It seems so much longer than that, but the country was ravaged by catastrophic bushfires and it was just a few months later that the world changed with the onslaught of the COVID-19 pandemic. As last year's Lowy Institute poll showed us, concern about COVID really did eclipse concern about climate change in Australia. And for the first time since 2012, the number of Australians that said we needed to take um, urgent and pressing measures about climate change fell in this country. But what we can see today in 2021 is that climate is returning to the forefront of Australians' concerns about the world. In the Lowy Institute's climate poll that I co-authored with Hannah Laser, and I think you all have a copy of today, it was really clear that this concern has increased yet again. The discussion here in Australia is changing. We saw an Australian federal court has ruled that the environment minister, Susan Lay, has a legal duty to not cause harm to the young people of Australia by exacerbating climate change when approving coal mining projects. We're seeing state governments move towards decarbonisation projects. We've seen our great ally, the United States, have officials that have said Australia is not doing its part on climate change. It's only part of the way in which this is gaining more momentum overseas. A Dutch court has ruled that Shell needs to cut greenhouse gas emissions by 45% um, by 2030. And we saw the G7 over the weekend commit to a global transition away from coal. I am so thrilled that we have this distinguished panel here today to talk about these important issues with us, the politics, the policies, and the public when it comes to climate change. First, here to my left, we have Innes Willox, the chief executive of the Australian Industry Group. He's previously served as the chief of staff to the Australian Minister for Foreign Affairs, Alexander Downer, and as the Australian Consul General in Los Angeles. Innes was meant to be here with us in person today, but he joins us from Melbourne um, because of recent restrictions, and we're very grateful that we could make this work. This is our first time hosting a hybrid panel of this nature at the Lowy Institute, so please bear with us, but also great thanks to my colleagues in events for making this work. Dr. Rebecca Huntley is an author, most recently of How to Talk About Climate Change in a Way That Makes a Difference. She has previously led research at Essential Media and Vox Populi, and published a report recently on how climate action can actually help Australia to recover from the COVID-19 pandemic. And then Nick O'Malley is the National Environment and Climate Editor for the Sydney Morning Herald and The Age. He's a former US correspondent, and we're just very lucky to have such an excellent panel of guests with us. So thank you all today. Thank you. Look, Nick, we're gonna start with you, just so we're all on the same page here today and for our audience listening and watching overseas. Do you think you could briefly run us through a, a very a brief history of the complicated politics of climate in Australia? Um, th <laughs> thank you for the question. Yes. question. It's a very easy one, of uh, course. The, the, I don't wanna sap anyone's will to live before we start, so I'll go <laughs> short. But uh, climate concern has been significant in the Australian electorate for as long as it has been in the world, I think. The first real policy goes back as far as Bob Hawke in 1989. Then if you fast forward through to the Howard government, there are, those, there are some people who argue that one of the reasons he began to lose touch with sections of the electorate was his hard stance against Kyoto. And then in 2007, you had Kevin Rudd campaign on this notion that climate change was the greatest moral challenge of our time, determined to take sweeping action, including uh, a carbon tax, which he uh, then prosecuted in government in 2007. And then you had those years that followed of really bitter climate warfare, which I won't go into huge detail over, <laughs> but uh, Rudd tried and failed to get a carbon tax up in parliament twice. He then backed down on, on forcing a double dissolution election, which uh, tarnished his tarnished his image because he had made that declaration that this was the greatest moral challenge. He then relied on trying to form a deal with the then leader of the opposition, Malcolm Turnbull, 
Malcolm Turnbull in turn was rolled by uh, a party room determined not to take action on climate change. Uh, the Abbott government was later formed. Tony Abbott famously uh, was again determined not to take that sort of action on climate change. He argued that what action should be taken shouldn't be through what he called a, a great big new tax, but any action should be um, some form of direct payment for, for climate mitigation. And then if you, uh, and he rolled back the, the brief window Australia had, when Australia had of an effective carbon tax, which did in the year it operated, reduce uh, emissions significantly. And then if you fast forward to, to today, I think it's fair to say that you have a, a prime minister whose views have shifted, I think because of international pressure and growing evidence, he is slowly trying to move the ball. You'll notice he doesn't, this is a man who once famously brought a lump of coal into parliament. He no longer discusses coal, but on the other hand, he's advocating a gas-led recovery, which climate scientists would say is not a great deal better. And you have a leader of the opposition equally determined not to see his leadership uh, and his whole policy platform caught up in this one infernal policy complex, who is so far uh, leading a party that is, is more determined to act, though divided, on climate, it still has members like Joel Fitzgibbon who insist that uh, coal has a long future and who don't want to damage their own electoral prospects for that reason. So as we head towards another election and as Australia heads towards uh, United Nations talks in Glasgow at the end of the year, you have two leaders, very, very, two party, a prime minister and a party leader, very delicate, uh, very gun shy on this issue. Yeah, that's fascinating. And of course, we're going to get into some of that international pressure. Of course, there's the real question of what do the public think about all of this? And Rebecca, you've been watching this closely. The ups and downs of Australian politics also in some way mirror what the public think about climate change. What, what do you think? How have these things shifted over the past decade? Uh, I think they've intersected with the public opinion. I wouldn't say they necessarily mirror it. So what we've had, as Nick said, over the last 20 years is a baseline concern in the community around environmental protection and climate, um, but a real difference between people for whom that is something that's their one or two, uh, their top one or two issues that determine their vote or how they... Um, might um, spend their money or invest their money. Um, we've seen, and people who are generally concerned, but waiting for leadership to connect how climate action is actually going to make their lives better. So, and it's in that group of people who are concerned about climate or want stuff to happen, but where climate and environment might be in their top five issues. Um, where how the national politics play out are very important to them, right, depending on whether it's something that they see as relevant or urgent or as something that's just mired in politics. Um, so, but what we have seen over that 20-year period in Australia is more and more Australians become alarmed about climate change. So we've seen um, in the research that we've done and the research that you've done and a whole lot of work that's being done in this area, we can probably say at least... Um, a quarter of the population are alarmed about climate and everybody else is on the spectrum, um, so to speak. I mean, there's certainly some people in the political parties that are on the spectrum in a bad way as well that are making things stop... that are kind of, um, I suppose, bottlenecks, right? But what is interesting to me is that if you look at the public opinion as it exists right now, only 9% of the community could genuinely de be described as climate deniers. 91% of the community are somewhere on the spectrum of basically taking the science seriously, realising that action on climate is something that should happen and should probably happen sooner rather than later. They're there to be convinced about what policies are the best way forward. The problem, of course, is that in politics and potentially in industry, although I've got to say business and industry are leading the national politics on this and have done in the last 18 months um, to two years in ways that are pretty impressive, um, you can have tiny groups of people within major political parties stop things happen in a way that doesn't happen with the electoral politics. The other thing I'd note too is that um, when you cut that data by generation, only 1% 
of um, Australians under the age of 25 are climate deniers and a very big group of them are alarmed. So you've got consumers and voters coming down um, the pipeline who are, you know, really going to put this as an issue. So the, the politics is changing, the, um, the business context is changing and the public opinion is changing as well and has even changed in the last 12 months as we've started to see Australia potentially get left behind. Um, the Biden administration's election, I think, is an important part of that. But I think it'll start to dawn on, um, on those people for whom climate and environment are maybe their number five and six issues, that actually there might be some economic imperatives for it to be more like three and four, perhaps potentially even two. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's a lot there, but I really want to bring Inez in here where... From the business perspective, you know, Rebecca's just mentioned that much of the public are really waiting for leadership. Is that what you're seeing amongst the business community or are they adapting because it makes sense to them? Well, hi everyone, hope you can hear me and uh, sorry I can't be there in person uh, in Melbourne. Um, we're stuck here for a little while longer, but hopefully I'll be up in Sydney soon. Look, this is a really interesting conversation and the way I'd characterise it Cash is this, that 20 years ago within business, it was, uh, no, we don't want to change. Then that's shifted to, uh, do we have to change? Then to, shall we change? And now it's really a how do we change conversation and business is pushing ahead with that. And what's pushing that apart from, you know, leadership and concern among business leaders that, uh, that they have to, you know, have to do and should be seen to be doing the right thing. There's also the concerns of um, investors, uh, customers, uh, suppliers, staff. All of these things are pushing business in a pretty clear direction. Um, now it's always heartening when I hear people say, because I tend to believe it myself and I've said it publicly, that business has really led this debate probably for the last you know, five or six years at least. They've sort of got out, got ahead of government policy in many cases. And uh, climate and energy, you know, which used to be, as somebody famously said to me once, was once the energy, paying the energy bill was what the person who paid for the staples did. That is now a boardroom issue. And it is uh, very much a front of mind issue for business. So. The question now that business has is that there are many ways to climb this mountain. What is the best way of doing it? Nick mentioned gas. For many, it, it's a necessity, gas, uh, in the way they do business. But for others, it's all about trying to find ways to work in with battery storage, development of new technology, hydrogen, all of those things. And then also the last point I'd make on this, Tash, is that we just saw the UK, Australia sign a trade agreement or the framework of a trade agreement overnight our time there's going to be enormous pressure on australia in the period ahead you talked about cop we talked about the biden administration movements that other uh, jurisdictions have made uh, to, to move in what you know business would see as a sensible direction in a policy sense here nick referred to it as moving slowly or something like that we refer to it as crowd war um, towards sort of a net zero by 2050 position so you know Government is 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 sort of is coming along. The question is how fast it's going and and how it is how it is adapting as well as well as the business community. So, there's some of the key things. I'm I'm very confident in the direction that's being taken by business, but not all business is the same. Not all business can move at a rapid rate. Uh, there's got to be different speeds, different trajectories, but. By and large, the conversation has moved on. I remember some fearsome battles. Um, I was involved in them. I led them at my organisation around this, around this issue, and we came up with core principles. You know, back in about 2013, which we've stuck to since around energy and climate. But we're heading in that that direction where basically, you know, everyone has got on board. And now at Australian Industry Group, which I lead, we're part of many different business fora and community for it as well, all trying to get policy alignment and agreement where possible. So it's it's real outliers now who uh, who have issues and problems around this space. It's now, as I started out by saying, question of how do we get there? Yeah, I think that's really fascinating. And it's pretty unusual for us to hear that, you know, 
business is out in front of a conservative mm. government. And so, Nick, what, what do you think about this, given there have been these kind of high levels of support for action now from the public, from business? What, what is that inertia? What is holding back the government at this point, or at least keeping this pace to a slow one? What I think there's think? a few things there. The most obvious is that I've heard Australia described, perhaps unfairly, as a lump of coal with sheep on it. <laughs> And there's a, reality, there's a base reality to, it, to the quip that the resources industry... Australia was made extremely wealthy very rapidly by coal, by coal that we exported and coal that we burnt for cheap energy. And there's no getting around that. Uh, and so when the world decided, as it has, that the time had come to stop burning fossil fuels and first off coal, that cost to Australia was greater. So the politics here was always going to be harder. Secondly, uh, it's become obvious that and this is related, that because of those resources industries, because of their long-standing wealth and power, they have far longer and far more established relationships through, with, with both parties, with governments, through um, business organisations, through personal relationships, through the trade union movement. Uh, they have the ear of government and of opposition in a way that is not replicated in, say, the United Kingdom, uh, in most of Europe, uh, it's changing in the United States, but that, it's been more similar there, but, but that has changed. And so the power of the resources industry to slow this process down can't be exaggerated. And then there is the, the very real and related effect on individuals' lives. How do you tell a 20-year-old in Muscle Book or somewhere who's earning, who doesn't have a trade qualification and might be earning as much or more than their high school principal that that way of life has to end? That's really hard and it's really unfair and it has an outsized implication on certain constituencies, which is why you see people like Joel Fitzgibbon advocating on behalf. At the moment, I think the Labor Party has failed to find an effective way to reassure those communities and industries that, well, we have to find a way for the whole community to bear this burden. Look, I just want to jump in there. As somebody who does... Um, endless focus groups in seats like the Hunter Valley with people like you've just described. It's actually a bit more complicated than that. Um, mining is the ninth biggest employer in the Hunter Valley. Not the first, the third, the seventh, the ninth. First is um, health care. Education's there, manufacturing's there, retail is there, disability services. It's the ninth. In five years, it'll be the 11th, <laughs> having worked with a lot of companies that are trying to get out of that area. So it's not so much that you go to the place like the Hunter Valley and there's tonnes of people employed directly in mining, because there aren't. There aren't, um, it's not a massive employer in the way that other employ, in, in a way that other industries are. It could, in fact, be a bigger employer if we move towards renewable energy, because there's going to be lots of opportunities in mining um, and lots of opportunities generally in manufacturing if we move quicker towards renewable energy. The problem is, is that if you do a focus group in a place like the Hunter Valley with a whole lot of people who actually aren't employed in mining, they think that mining is absolutely critical to the future prosperity of Australia. They, and when you say to them, how many people are employed in mining in Australia? They say, 250,000. And then when you tell them how much it actually is, it's about, you know, sort of know the exact numbers, about 10,000 in coal, maybe less in gas. And we're talking about Australian, but they're surprised. But then they also say, but those are real jobs. Those mm. are jobs that sustain communities. It is so demoralising to be with a group of people in the Hunter Valley who work in disability services, who are teachers, who are shop owners and they say, those, our jobs aren't as important. We cost the government money. We don't make Australian money. Now, in fact, every, <laughs> every industry, including education, makes Australia a lot of money. The problem is the role that the fossil fuel industries have had over time, and some of that has been justified and some of that has been because of a very effective public opinion campaign to say we are essential, has made people think that we can't live without them. And it's made people diminish those sectors that have also been critical to Australian prosperity, such as education. So I think there is something more fundamental here about the role of fossil fuels and the Australian imagining of what prosperity looks like. And we have to, it's very difficult to unpick that and it's very difficult to challenge that. But we do have to go some way towards doing that because it is stopping us 
helping shape the Australian economy in a direction that will actually deliver jobs for that 20-year-old in Musselbrook, because I can guarantee you at 45 he will not be working in the mining industry. What does that look like for you, Ines? What do you think? Are there, you know, are you hearing kind of similar stories from the people you talk to? And how are your members and the people you work with thinking about these economic opportunities as we go forward and as Australia's economy inevitably shifts? Well, this, this is one you've got to spend a little bit of time unpacking. Mining itself employs about 2% of the total Australian workforce. That's the data point. But there are obviously many points back from that where it supports further employment. But in itself, it's not a huge employing sector. Where it is huge is in the income it generates for the economy. Uh, and, you know, our trade to China is, or was, up until the latest disputes, about $160 billion a year. Iron ore is about $80 billion of that, about half uh, in terms of the, of the income generated. Um, it's the same as an exporter of coal. Australia is in the top two coal exporters globally. Uh, that, that doesn't mean we, we have to keep using it here, but there's obviously going to be a continuing industry for export for some time to come. These are not simple decisions just to walk away from that uh, and the economic benefits that it brings. So there's sort of a dual carriageway approach here where you're looking at employment and you're looking at revenue that is generated for the country and, and holding up living standards as a result of that. I mean, you wouldn't want to really think about where Australia would be right now uh, if it weren't for um, income generated out of mining. But business is, going back to your point there, Tash, business is, is moving. Um, there's a very concerted effort around uh, what you might call fuel switching uh, going on and there's a big effort that's being put in by business into energy efficiency, which is where we would all think some of the great gains could be made in terms of emissions. Um, these are important issues and decisions that businesses are taking now. Um, there are going to be jobs created from um, renewables. So you look at one of our big members, Blue Scope Steel, um, they just appointed uh, an executive to their management team specifically to look after the climate and energy issues. And this is part of the journey that they and other steel companies globally are on towards what you might call green steel. Now, it's a little way off, but they're on that journey uh, and, they, and you know, they're determined to get there um, and, and play their part. Uh, it's the same right across other sectors. I talked a little bit earlier about that climate uh, roundtable that we're part of with the National Farmers Federation. The NFF has got to the point of supporting net zero by 2050. The Aluminium Council is in the same boat, you know, and they're big energy users. So they're trying to find creative ways to contribute. And, you know, this has the potential to be a a significant job creator, but also a significant knowledge creator as we go through the development of new energy development and new technology development. Um, so look, business is thinking about this in pretty creative ways and different ways. And that's what, where this conversation is really bears no likeness to what it was 10 years ago. Um, these are front of mind conversations. And it goes back to where I started. It's around what the community wants and expects and using that data point that Rebecca mentioned 91% uh, you know, uh, in favour in one way or the other of, of action on climate, the questions around pace, scale and all of that. But business recognises that and they go where their customers go uh, and where influences around them go, staff, investors and the like. So this is a big opportunity for Australia. Now, the question is, going back to Musselbrook and your 20-year-old, how do you make that transition and and make it clear to a 20-year-old in Musselbrook who does expect a significant ways like that, that there are other opportunities out there for them and you do it in a way which is reasonable and fair and provides them with opportunities to continue to, to make a good living. You know, I just, I mean, one of the things that's really clear, I do, I do a bit of work with um, uh, uh, corporations in hard to decarbonise industries. And I, once upon a time, I might have included agriculture for that, but that's actually doing, there's actually a lot of, that's a lot that's happening in, 
in the ag sector, which is exciting. But there are, there are big employers and big important Australian companies we want to be around for another 100 years that are hard to decarbonise. And it's kind of easy... You know, it's it, it's not like IKEA. <laughs> They're not like IKEA. They're not like those kinds of organisations that can do, can make pretty aggressive um, targets. And and when I do work with them, it's really clear that lack of federal consistency around policy around framework is actually incredibly difficult. There are some organisations that can creatively move quickly, without national policy settings um, providing. Um, a lot of incentive for that, but there are other other organisations which desperately need that, and they're not going to be able. They might get you know 50% of the way there. They're not going to get anywhere close to near where they need to without some um, without the federal government stepping up. They've been happy that the state governments have done what they've had to do, but that's where um, that's where it's clear that that lack of consistency and lack of framework is really hampering what they want to do. They might be they might be happy with what state governments doing, but they're also concerned that states and federal and various states and federal are moving at different paces. So there's that lack of consistency and coherence across all the eight jurisdictions. That's what really worries business when you get different policy settings in different jurisdictions. That's what makes life very hard for them. That's why a nationally consistent framework is crucial to have any success here. I think that there's an interesting almost disconnect between the idea of having this conversation today and how much it's shifted in 10 years. But then you look at, for example, the Global Energy Monitor, and when it, you look at the regions of the world where the most new coal-fired power plants are planned, Queensland is number one on the list, right? You look at what our polling shows, and 63% of Australians would support reducing coal exports overseas. You know, the same number would support banning new coal mines. Only 30% support creating kind of new... Um, subsidising new coal-fired power plants. And then on the weekend, of course, the G7 leaders signalled um, an end to direct government support for coal power generation by the end of this year. So, Nick, could you tell us a little bit about what happened here at the G7 and how Australia is reacting to that? Well, one of the things that the G7 uh, agreed on, the, the, the leaders of the group of wealthiest nations agreed on, was that they do not like what they perceive, what, what they call in their uh, communique as carbon leakage. Um, this is what happens when... Uh, it's not obscene. This is, this is what happens when a jurisdiction like the EU has a, uh, a carbon tax um, of about 80 bucks a ton, or a price of about $80 a tonne at the moment. And so if you want to emit carbon in your factory in the EU, that's how much you have to pay. Uh, after they introduced that, the U U uh, some companies in Ukraine thought beauty and set up steelworks just outside the EU and started importing steel. That is what is referred to as carbon leakage, when, when your own manufacturers or producers are undercut by carbon-free imports. Now, the Group of Seven leaders agreed on Sunday that they wanted to prevent this, and the way to do that is what the EU is about to announce, which is a carbon border tariff. And other countries that have already flirted with this are uh, the US under Biden, Japan, South Korea. Later on this year, we expect China to introduce its own uh, price. So these aren't in place yet. But what we're seeing, and this is the problem that Australian governments face, is that the debate we're having here and not resolving is going to be resolved overseas. They're going to decide eventually, well, no, you can't import Australian aluminium unless it's green without paying a price. Similarly, when we come to negotiate a free trade agreement with the EU, they're going to start. In fact, they've already declared they're going to look at agricultural clearing. They're going to look at all of these other land practices which they either prevent in the EU or disapprove of. So the failure in Australia to come to a resolution is, as Innes has already said, becoming not something which supports Australian industry and manufacturing, but something which is a burden. The political failure is now a burden. And I've spoken with climate activists uh, in the past year who have said to me, just to go back to points that you've both made, they almost throw their hands up. They look at how far the private sector has come in the past couple of years and say, we've been wasting our time for a generation. Because what has happened in the past few years with, with huge pools of money mm -hmm. controlled by fund managers like BlackRock and Vanguard declaring that they're, they're going to set their own climate standards, 
has blown away generations, according to some people's despairing argument, blown away generations of climate activism, and it is, it is the government that's being left behind. But I think one of the things that... You're exactly right. So um, in some work that I was doing for Aware Super, who... Um, big industry super fund that are doing a lot of investing in renewable energy. I interviewed Tony Wood at the Grattan Institute and he just said to me, look, the world will make a decision for us it on is, climate yeah. and those decisions will not necessarily... Australia's best interest, our national interest, will not be at the centre of those mm. decisions. So we've had this kind of hubris to think that we can just not, decide, not make a decision mm. on climate and go our own way or kind of delay. So we either decide well with our national interests at the centre of it, or we're forced to decide reactively and badly. Or we pay a carbon tax to an Australian mm. government, or a carbon tax to the EU. I'd rather pay a carbon tax to Australia <laughs> than do good things with it if we can. So, Inez, how much is this factoring into exporter thinking at the moment? Are we going to end up in what seems to me almost unfeasible, where Australian industry is almost calling for a carbon tax here in Australia? Well, I have to declare here that I'm the Deputy Chair of Australian Super and I sit on the Investment Committee. So we're funneling billions of dollars around all the time and we put ESG, you know, not you know, front and centre, but very much in front of mind of investment decisions that we make. Um, and, that, and climate is a key part of that and how businesses respond on climate issues. The issue there, just to say, is that you, know, you, you have to have an understanding, I think, as Rebecca made the point earlier, that not all businesses can suddenly jump across the, the pond and become renewables-based businesses overnight. Everyone is, to use the, the, the vernacular, on a journey here, and some will go faster than others. Um, but it's about what, you know, what the intent here, and, you know, and there is a, a risk that those who aren't you know, real risk, that those who aren't you know, just going to get left behind. Um, Nick referred to the G7 um, you know, meeting. I think that's sort of putting down some markers, probably more towards where COP26 will go in November. I mean, I'll just tell you a story. I was, I was interested in the Australia UK FTA and Boris Johnson's comments that look, he thought Australia was heading in the right direction. And I, I can make an argument for that too. And I've made it to Boris's climate champion, uh, uh, Nick Topping, on that Australia is, is moving. It's just moving in a different way. The, the response to that is, well, what's the point of having a plan if you don't have a target and that you can flip that back? What's the point of having a target if you don't have a plan? You can, you can work that through. But when I was at a session with uh, Boris Johnson about a month ago as part of the B7, the Business 7, uh, for um, ahead of the G7, he gave a presentation and all he wanted to talk about was climate. And he talked about the benefit of climate uh, in job creation. Uh, and he talked about the environmental impacts, obviously. But he ended his, his, his speech in typical Boris fashion by quoting Gordon Gecko and saying, green is good. He kept repeating, green is good, green is good. You can tell where they're going can tell where the EU is going, and the EU will probably be the first ones to make the jump around what you would call carbon tariff, um, and then how Australia reacts to that. That's going to be really when rubber hits the road at a government level. Uh, that's when the rubber will really hit the road. It's interesting, you, took, you mentioned carbon tax. I, I suspect you've got to come up with another formulation than tax, carbon tax, because we've run that, that argument's been run here, run here a decade ago. We all saw how that ended. I mean, I would argue from a business perspective, the $26 a tonne price business was asked to pay then was far in excess of what was should have realistically been put forward. But the, 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 the talk of a, a tax here, I think is gonna be a very difficult argument to run and win um, within, big sections of the community who might normally be supportive. So it's about trying to find another mechanism. Um, that would be where I'd, where I'd put that at the moment. That's still to be played out. Yeah, and that's certainly what we found. We asked about introducing an emissions trading scheme or a carbon tax, and we had 64% say that they were in favour. But Rebecca, I want to come to you here on some of this kind of international pressure that we're hearing from the EU, from the US, from the UK, of course. Is that 
having a domestic impact in terms of public views? And how do you think that might play out? Yeah, I think it is. I think that, um, you know, 20 years of listening to Australians talk about how we imagine ourselves, um, and some of that's right and some of that isn't right, we have tend to think of ourselves as having a wonderfully clean environment, about being good on environmental issues, about, about you know, doing our fair share and, um, and uh, you know, and, and that, I think, is shifting. Um, I think, to some extent, what's happening with the Great Barrier Reef has shifted that a bit. And, again, some of that's public perception and, and um, filtering down. I think... Uh, there is this sense that if they feel, if, if, if we feel like the world is moving on energy, and particularly China and the US, but even to a greater or lesser extent, um, Japan and Korea, who are really kind of critical um, partners for us with export, if people kind of work out that they're moving, that we might be left behind. And I certainly talk to a lot of my clients about harnessing this sense of FOMO, fear of missing out. Um, and that if we can, and that will that will change. And I think the Biden administration is already making Australians feel like perhaps we're not going, um, keeping a pace. We don't necessarily want to be leaders, but we certainly don't want to be laggards. And if if we are, and if the fact that we are laggards is connected with a real problem with the economy, that ongoing we can't really expect that we're actually missing out on economic opportunities in the region or globally. Um, if that really starts to sink in, not with people who are alarmed about climate change, but those people who are generally concerned but don't think about it, if they see it in those terms, then, then that's going to shift. And then things like, for example, some kind of price on carbon or whatever me mechanism might um, be seen as de rigueur everywhere else, particularly with our export partners, and that will be important. And I think you're starting to see that at the sector level. I mean, I presented to... Um, uh, a department, uh, a state department in the primary industry a couple of months ago, and they were particularly concerned about the idea, not so much of, you know, farming in the climate age, which is very difficult, but what that was going to mean for exports if Australia didn't look like it was really um, keeping a pace with what was happening. So I think that economic conversation is changing. Our understanding of how we're perceived globally is starting to slowly filter through and perhaps really deflate this idea that actually we're great on climate and we're all fine and we're great on environment and isn't this a wonderful... I mean, this is a wonderful country with clean air and all the rest of it, but hubris or um, uh, laziness around that is not a great... It's not, it's not good. <laughs> Now, I'm going to come to the audience in a moment, so please uh, do get your questions ready. But before I do, I think there's a really interesting kind of issue here where, as mentioned already, Nick, the UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson says that Australia is moving in the right direction and, you know, he says that Australia has set a net zero emissions target for 2050. One of your colleagues, preferably. one of your co well, one of your colleagues from the audience says, actually, that's preferably, which is of course Australia's policy. And the next day, you have the Nationals on Australian television saying there's no agreement in Australia to set a date for a zero emissions target. All of this international pressure, all of this business pressure, can can, can we get beyond it when we still have this kind of happening in the party room? <coughs> I've got absolutely. No idea is the honest answer to that. I mean, given that there has been so much blood, political blood spilt over this, and given that some of the positions that have been drawn by some of the key players here are so stark, it's hard to imagine it at present. There are, there are many people, I understand, uh, and I'm not a Canberra reporter, I'm not completely plugged in, I'm, I'm talking about what I'm reading and, and colleagues I'm speaking with and contacts I'm speaking with, there are people uh, there are a lot of people in Cabinet who would like to move forward and who emphasise to me when I speak with them uh, the Prime Minister's movement on this. But there are those who get up and very publicly and very determinedly demonstrate that they are not having a bar of it. And I can't see how that changes in the coalition. And equally, it's difficult to see how it changes at present in the ALP. Um, I remember visiting Germany as they were closing down their thermal mines. Well, they're still in the process, but visiting them to, to see how they were going about this. And 
the key way they were doing it was by agreement. They had uh, a task force put together with representatives of the coal mining companies, the unions and the government, who all worked together. And then they slowly picked which mines would be closed down when and moved workers from one to the next and paid those who wanted to retire early a handsome sum to retire. And I said, can you, I said to, to one of the union leaders who was instrumental in crafting that policy and who does spend a lot of time in Australia and talks with the CFME mining division, I said to him, can you imagine that happening here? And he said, no way. He couldn't imagine a circumstance in which those three sectors could work together. And then when I raised it with Australian miners, they pointed out that the relationship between the, the energy producers and the, and the conservative government was just as bad as the relationship between the unions and the government. In fact, some of the unions and the producers were talking more clearly to one another than worth the government. So there, there is a lot of bad blood in the water and it, mm. I find it difficult to see at present how there will be a, 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 road, a road map to use the vernacular that's used mm. at the moment laid out that would lead to rapid decarbonisation of the Australian economy. And look, you, and you've also got the fact that, look, every federal election since 2007 has come down to a handful of seats. So essentially a handful of voters in a handful of seats. All, both political parties understand the need to narrow cast to that group. Um, and having done that kind of research, I can tell you that um, it's very easy to scare them about what rapid decarbonisation would mean to the economy and to them. So in many cases, obfuscation or let's just not talk about climate change and try and win them on other things is the, tactic, is the way to go forward. So I can also understand why that hampers the politics as well. But business movement is really rapid. Yeah, which I think is a fascinating dynamic. Before I go to the audience, I actually did just want to ask you, Rebecca, you know, we talked about pressure from the EU, from the US, the UK. We didn't talk about the Pacific, which yeah. has had a kind of long-standing frustration with Australia's uh, inertia on these policies. Yeah, I've always thought, look, I've thought if you are really, really want, if you really want safe, strong borders and you don't want refugees coming here by boat, then you should worry about climate change. We're going to have people of the Torres Strait, probably after the first ever climate refugees in their own country, um, needing to be resettled. We're going to have, you know, some really significant issues in the Pacific. We already have some diplomatic challenges in the Pacific and the role of the Pacific in terms of their ongoing relationship with China and, and the US. So I think we ignore that at our peril. But like I said, you know, there's been some really worrying projections around what um, what climate change is going to do with global issues around asylum, you know, around refugees and those kinds of problems with migration. So, like I said, you know, if you really want, say, strong borders and not people arriving on boats, then that might be something you should be worried about. Might turn to the audience now. If you could put up your hand, wait for a microphone to come to you and um, just uh, introduce yourself before you ask your question so that Inners can hear you as well. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Freddie Sharp. It's clear from what you've all said that the only single roadblock in this country to effective climate policy is the federal Liberal National Party. Every state and territory government has a commitment to carbon neutral by 2050. Matt Keane in New South Wales is the most progressive politician in the country, bar none, on climate change. So I'd like to add maybe a note of optimistic hope, uh, a precedent. Uh, there are two or three sacred cows in right-wing politics in Australia and around the world. One is budget surpluses are all important. The other one is climate change is not real and should be resisted. Any action to mitigate it should be resisted. We've actually shot that first sacred cow in the last 18 months. In the face of an existential crisis like COVID, deficit spending around the world has gone into overdrive. Our own government is spending record amounts of government money, as they should, sensibly at last, on boosting the economy. That's one sacred cow gone. Is that enough of a precedent for the rump of the right wing in the Liberal National Party coalition room to go, maybe we can crab walk our way out of this and recognize the reality of it? It's just a sacred cow. Cows can be shot. Let's move on. How positive can you guys be about the fact there is a precedent that we no longer care about deficits? That sounds like a Nick question. Sounds like a Nick question. Oh, oh, thanks. <laughs> um, I don't think that well, the... Well, I'll have a go. Yes, please. Go ahead. Go for it. <laughs> thanks, Nick. 
Um, look, COVID has done many strange things to body politics all over the world. Um, so debt and deficit is not a big issue now, but that's not to say that it won't come back to be one uh, in, in the years ahead. Um, we're just in sort of uh, incredibly unusual times. I'd be looking to the, to the next budget to really get a, a line, a bead on, on where a coalition government, if they're re-elected and don't have a budget before the next election, where they, where they head on debt and deficit. I think they are crab walking towards you know, a, a, a net zero by 2050 position. It's, it's, the Treasurer mentioned it in his budget speech. If you were to think the Coalition Treasurer would mention net zero by 2050 in a budget speech, you know, three years ago, I would have, you know, I would have run, you know, naked down Burke Street. It has been big transitions occurring um, within politics. The issue quite realistically is when you think back, Malcolm Turnbull, at the National Energy Guarantee attempt to put that through, that got blocked by maybe six, maybe eight coalition backbenchers. That's really what it turned on in the end. Politics change all the time. The dynamics of those parties change all the time. Um, it's going to be fascinating to see what happens post-election if, if the coalition gets up, what happens within the National Party. Um, that'll, that'll be one to watch because there are two wings of the National Party on this as well. So I think, you know, things will move and continue to move in, a, in what you and I would probably call a positive direction. And it's not going to jump there. They're going to sort of inch their way there. And as, as political parties, the makeup of them change, situations change. And I think as Nick's made clear, it's, and, and, and Rebecca, it's the same in the Labor Party. There are enormous differences there uh, at, a, at a national level too. And they will all play out in time, so I'm I'm more optimistic than not, and this is from someone who sort of lived through, you know, almost 20 years of, of watching and being involved in these fights from various perspectives. I'm sort of more confident now than that we'll get to where we where we want to get to than I have been in a very long time. And and just to add, in terms of the shifts in the Labor Party, the dynamics in the union movement are shifting again slowly. Everything that happens in the union movement <laughs> happens quite slowly. Um, the movement from the um, AMW and the ETU has been interesting. The rhetoric's different there. Um, again, the ACTU are managing that carefully. Um, uh, and then, of course, all that needs to happen is the Labor Party needs to feel like it can win in the critical seats where coal plays a role or, or fossil fuels have played a role in prosperity in the past, maybe not necessarily in the future in those Queensland seats and holding on to the hunter, but also potentially in places like Tasmania. You know, Tasmania is 82% hydro, right? Um, they're not, there's nobody down there working <laughs> in coal and there's lots of opportunities, for example, in green hydrogen in that kind of, in that state, as well as in tourism and protecting that state. So there are ways that you can have conversations with key electorates that you need to hold on to and win. And once they've nailed that, then the politics will change and that union politics is also changing. Yeah, I think in our poll we found that the question of cost is really shifting where 74% of Australians said that the benefits of taking action on climate change would outweigh the costs. And we're really starting to see the conversation move from the costs of action to what are the costs of inaction. And so I think that does have perhaps optimistic flow on effects. Um, we'll take another question from Alex Oliver, the Director of Research here at the Lowy Institute. <coughs> oh, just wait for the mic, Alex. Oh, sorry, thanks. Thank you for your time and expertise tonight. Um, I've got a question for Inners. Um, the Finkel review, I can't remember what year it was, but um, uh, the emissions intensity scheme um, undid the Turnbull government as the carbon tax undid the Gillard government. And you talk about finding a different mechanism. So if, if the government were to crack walk its way to a zero by 2050 target and uh, and the Morrison government is saying you know it's it's how we get there that's important not what the target is can do you or your members who are presumably very influential with government do you think that you can get there without a mechanism like a carbon tax or an intensity scheme and if you do need a mechanism what on earth could it be since we have been through such exhaustive processes trying to find a mechanism that actually works 
Yeah, Alex, it's a good question. I mean, within Australia, we've tried every sort of method. So we've had, you know, baseline and credits. We've had um, carbon taxes. We've had every sort of initiative under the sun to get there. Um, there in, in any measure, there has to be carrots and sticks incentives to behave in one way or another. So I, I don't think the settlement yet around exactly what an incentive can look could and should look like or you know, the amount it should be or anything like that or you know, how it's paid, who it's paid to, all of that. I think I think we probably still have to unfortunately go through another iteration on that. But I think the the view is that we'd I mean to be quite blunt, we'd probably rather get there without one. Um, but it may be that there has to be some some mechanism like that to 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 pull us up to the line. Not clear yet, to be honest yet, around what that looks like. I think at the moment, the conversation is very much like the one we've just been having. It's about trying to shift my, um, mindsets um, to, to achieving the target. And just from talking and you know, listening to Rebecca, I remember, I'm sure she won't mind. I did one of these similar sort of sessions uh, about eight years ago with Jed Carney when she was president of the ACTU. And this issue around cold jobs versus green jobs was incredibly difficult. And in fact, Jed poor thing put her head in her hands at the end you know, and said, this is all too hard. You know, it's me, this is all too hard. But but we are moving. So if we get the if you get the recognition around, okay, net zero by 2050 is the goal. We're going to use technology to get there, which makes a lot of sense if you think about it. What else do we need, you know, as as incentives and what do they look like? I think that's the third act of what will be a three-act play that we're in at the moment. One of the things that hasn't really shifted over time is 80 to 90% of Australians have been consistently supportive of investing in more kind of renewable technology. And so I think that part of it is not going anywhere. Um, we had another question here, Andrew. Uh, Jay Horton. A question to either Innes or Nick. Why is a net zero 2050 goal a good policy for Australia? Uh, I'm happy for, for Innes to answer this as well, but I've got a couple of thoughts on that. 2050 was first established by, because scientists said that was where we needed to get to, to be on track to withhold warming to something close to the Paris targets. Uh, but since then, because even since the Paris Agreement was drawn, the world has failed to act fast enough it's only in Australia that we're discussing 2050 anymore. When I talk with scientists, they say, well, net zero by 2050 is too little too late. Uh, the targets internationally have already come forward in most countries. Uh, and in fact, most international leaders are talking about 2030, not 2050, because a 2050 target is meaningless if you don't act sooner. So that's if you accept those premises. The other thing I'd say is that, um, Given that scientists already, no, I'll, I'll leave that aside and invite if NS wants to say anything on that. But the other thing I'd say is that there's no other field of human endeavour that I know of where we expect people to extend themselves or systems to change without a target. And in fact, it, it seems to me very odd that we would say, well, we won't have a target. It, it to me, at, at its face value, doesn't make a lot of sense. Things, people coalesce around targets, uh, they innovate around targets. Inez, did you want to chime in on that as well? Yeah, it's a good question, Jay. I mean, I, I, I could, I could, I don't want us to sound like sheep, and that's not my intention at all, but there is global movement and momentum around this now it, and if Australia, which, which is a far different economic makeup to any other country on the planet, and I think that was recognised by Boris Johnson in his comments overnight. But if Australia doesn't make movement, we'll get, we'll be isolated. Um, and I think that's important because, you know, one in five Australian jobs relies on, on trade. Um, you know, over 40% of our GDP comes from trade. And, you know, we need to be in a position to be able to be, to remain a trading nation and we do run the risk of being heavily penalised or excluded if we don't move 
in that direction. Now, there's an argument around, do you set the target or do you have the plan? And I think they, that's a legitimate argument to have. It's like going up a mountain two different ways, but as long as you get to that point is what the important thing here, I think, realistically is um, for the international community. Um, it's important because other other countries are moving in that direction. They're coming off a different base and we have to be recognised as having a different base. But we, we, have to, we have to play our part. And every time another major economy makes a shift in this direction, the pressure on us just globally, the eyes just turn on us globally. Um, and so we're not gonna solve it on our own. I don't think anyone's saying that, you know, we're not gonna be the saviors. So when you talk to some of the CSIRO scientists, some of the, you know, their predictions or, or prognostications around what happens if we don't make, you know, you know, the 1.5 degree target are pretty horrifying, you know, whether you want to believe them or not. But we, you know, in the end, you know, we have to play our part as a trading nation be seen to play our part. I think there is also a element of pragmatism. Most of Australia's coal and gas is exported overseas. And as my colleague Roland Raja has written about, you know, 70% of that is going to Asian markets that have now set net zero targets. And so the economics are really shifting. I will take a question now from Michael Fulilab, the Executive Director at the Lilly Institute. Thank you very much, Tash. And thank you, Rebecca and Nick and Ines, uh, for a terrific conversation. And I want to follow up Ines, by asking you a question about your last answer and this, this issue of isolation that you mentioned. Um, and let me draw on your experience, not just as head of AIG, but as an Australian diplomat <coughs> and an advisor to the Australian Foreign Minister. A lot of the history of Australia's relationship with the world is about fear of isolation and uh, being so distant from our sources of security and prosperity, we've always been joiners by instinct and involving ourselves in conflicts and debates and trade all over the world. But is there a sense in which there's a real danger of isolation for us at the moment? We're physically isolated from the world. The government has told us we can't, uh, the borders won't reopen for 12 months. We're at daggers drawn with our largest economic partner, our largest trading partner. And now we're at odds with our oldest um, allies, the United States and the United Kingdom. Is this an uncomfortable position for a country like Australia that doesn't like being isolated? It sure is, Michael. It's, it's desperately uh, uncomfortable and, and has the potential to become exceptionally uncomfortable. We're probably, I mean, this is, you might think this is an odd thing to say, but we're probably in a bizarre way lucky that we have the security challenges we have at the moment because they're a counterpoint um, in all of this. The, the, the China relationship is devilishly difficult, as you know, but that has made Australia even more important in a security sense, um, you know, in terms of its relationship with the United States and Western allies. So we've probably been able, we're probably able to play that card. You know, they need us as much as we need them in a security front which probably takes a bit of heat off the debate that might otherwise be there. If the Biden administration come in and they were you know, pretty hot to trot on climate, it was one of the issues, it was one of the three big ones that President Biden raised that he wanted to address in his, first, in his term as president. Um, so you know, we're probably in a fortunate position, there's not more pressure on us. And I can, but I can see that coming uh, Michael, particularly around the COP, I think. And it's going to be, I mean, I'm not a political commentator, but it's been interesting to see if we have an election before November or not, and then how that plays out at the COP, whoever wins. That's going to be a pretty important moment in this debate, this discussion. But Australia doesn't like to be alone. Um, a big geographic land mass with a, with a, uh, a very different economy to the rest of the world. Uh, and an export reliant economy. That, what, that is what makes us want to have friends and be liked uh, and be part of the game. And in trade, we were co leading performers of the, the Cairns group, for instance. You know, we've always played a, a big role in these multilateral global issues. And um, I can tell there's going to be a lot of pressure through later this year for 
probably for more from Australia as, as this unfolds. And as Boris Johnson, you know, he's holding COP, he'll want to make a statement there. Uh, America will, the US will want to put um, a stake in the ground there. And we've got the EU trade negotiations all coming to a head around the end of this year. That's going to be a very important time in this conversation. It is, it's an interesting gamble, isn't it, from a politician's point of view, that this idea of Australia kind of closed, Australia that doesn't really care about whether we play a big role or we keep pace with the world, that that, that group of voters in that clutch of seats are not going to care and are quite happy that they don't have to travel overseas, except maybe they would like to go to Bali, but that's OK, they'll go to Queensland. It's a gamble that those people aren't going to care about these things and we can continue to shut down, shut down, shut down. There will be a moment when even that fiction will not be able to be sustained, that that, that small group of voters in those small group of seats will go, actually, we really can't go it alone <laughs> on this or a whole range of other things and we've got a lot of catching up to do. We do not want to be out shivering in the courtyard smoking a cigarette with two other, a couple of other rogue nations while everybody's inside having a COVID safe party. <laughs> but that I sometimes worry is that that's where we're headed. Look, it wouldn't be a conversation. No, I'm, not, I'm not sure COVID safe parties are that much fun, but there's always <laughs> going to be. No, everyone's immunised. Everybody in the party's immunised. And we're not. Look, it wouldn't be a there's, conversation there's at the be, Institute yeah, yeah. if we didn't there's raise there's, China and Fortress Australia in the last minute. We just made it, so um, <laughs> I'm glad to hear it. But look, this has been a fascinating discussion. I'm really sorry we didn't get to everybody's questions, but I hope you can stick around for some wine and cheese. Um, please join me in thanking our fabulous panellists today. Thank you. Uh, I'm very pleased that the Lowy Institute is hosting this Friday a conversation with Ted Hui, legislator in exile from Hong Kong, and there are still some tickets available if anybody is interested. And then next week, an online event with the American writer Lawrence Wright. Please sign up for those on our website. We're really pleased to have you back in the building again, and we look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you.